I'm going to give you an example. Like this is like picture perfect. This is what I picture perfect is what occurs with my clients. I don't know about anyone else, but picture perfect is what I shoot for with my clients. I let them know all the vulnerabilities at, at stake, all the risk so that we know what can potentially come in our direction. And we're looking for the perfect scenario that suits just exactly what we're looking to accomplish, right? So let's start there. Take to the whiteboard here. Four major numbers on the board. Here's an example. Person making 13,500 a month. We have expenses at 11,500. This 11,500 accounts for everything. Cost of living, all debt payments, right? Unexpected, miscellaneous, giving, tithing, saving, investing. All of it's included in the 11,5. 13,5 is what we net. 11,5 is total overestimated expenses, leaving us with a net cash flow of 2000 bucks. We're going to implement velocity banking. This person's already saving money. This person's already investing money. This person's already giving money. This person is a disciplined individual. So I'm giving you the context of this particular scenario here. We have someone that has a track record of saving money. This is a person that has a track record of investing successfully and multiplying their money. This is a track record of someone that has an extensive career, long-term career in the same position, uh, highly disciplined in their craft. This is a person that has discipline when it comes to spending money, their cost of living, they manage their money. So velocity banking is an add-on, okay? There's many risk factors that just got eliminated when I give you that context. If you don't have that initial discipline coming into this particular strategy and you watch videos like mine and others and think that this is going to be so easy as some may claim and then come to find out you're struggling. You're seeing people have success on the YouTubes and you're seeing the case studies, but many people are struggling on this channel. I primarily run a financial clinic. I help those that are struggling with velocity banking. I help those that have spent thousands of dollars with gurus and coaches and programs. I help those one-to-one -one that are in negative cash flow situations, paycheck to paycheck. I help those that buy high-end softwares and struggle. And they're like, I'm not getting it. This is where coaching is so powerful. The one-to-one -one accountability, the discussions back and forth, right? The conversations, the breakthroughs, the awareness that we get to have. This is key stuff if we want to implement this strategic complex strategy for success, I'm, I'm sure you would agree. I'm sure you would agree. So that's the context of the individual and their numbers, 800,000 of debt. Okay. Leverage rules. Very important. You need to know the leverage rules. You have to know what your leverage capacity. So there are leverage rules and there is your personal leverage capacity. I can tell you with full confidence, my leverage capacity to carry debt as of today in 2024, as a 28 year old male, young guy engaged myself, the max amount of debt I'm willing to put myself in is $630,000. Everyone in the room here has a debt threshold or what I like to call a leverage capacity, the amount of debt that you're willing to carry in your life to achieve a particular result at a particular time and place. So you may be carrying or servicing debts on your business, in your personal life, cars, student loans, your mortgage, right? But it, there comes a time where you have the cars, you have the student loans on you, on wife and then kids. And then you start racking up the credit cards and then you start racking up a personal loan here or there. And then you borrow from, from mom or dad, and then you have a mortgage and then you get a second mortgage. All of a sudden you start experiencing a high level of stress, anxiety, your performance goes down, your leverage capacity. And you, you got there unknowingly and now you're experiencing all this stress, pain and worry and doubt and fear. But had you had the rules and know what your capacity was, go right up to it bring it down, go right up, bring it down. So that when we're getting close and an amazing irresistible offer on the internet pops up, you have the dis discipline to say no, even if it's a 500% rate of return guaranteed like those exist, right? Even when the guru says, 
guaranteed not to lose your money. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Get in now. It is going away. You're going to have the discipline to say no because you're approaching your what? Your leverage capacity, your leverage threshold, right? Now, if you're all the way down here, 100,000 in debt, and your leverage capacity is 630, we have a nice gap. The question then becomes how much? Here's where the rules come in, okay? So, in any situation at any point in time, whether you're debt free or whether you're fully in debt, fully leveraged up to your ears, these are the leverage rules that. I have followed for the last six years working with my clients that have proven success over and over and over again. It is, it is. So I take the individual's cash flow times 12, right? What is their monthly cash flow per month? Conservative times 12. So I'm underestimating, leaving room for buffer. As you can see, there's a round numbers. I round it up, round it up actually round down, round up, come to a $2,000 cash flow, two times 12, we're at 24,000 bucks. We have a home equity line of credit, 150,000, 4.99% intro rate for the first six months. 150,000 is the max credit limit on their main debt tool. So this is their main 150,000 times two thirds, it's 99 thousand dollars so what these two numbers just gave us is our chunk whether we are investing one going to be one of the two either we're borrowing a chunk of money to invest because we don't have the capital saved we're borrowing a, a chunk of money to eliminate a debt to increase cash flow one provides a guarantee the other is not has a risk but a higher return ideally this chunk range simply says hey Denzel, if you're making 13.5 a month and you're spending 11.5 and you have 2,000 left over and you chunk $24,000 toward an investment or debt payoff, you are essentially putting 12 months of future cash flow at risk. Now, me personally, I like to stay within the range of leveraging 12 months of future cash flow. I, I don't like to go too much higher than that. If I do, I need to have a valid reason. Why am I doing that in the first place? Let's say we're going to pay off debt. And here is the debt. We have a car, $55,000. The interest rate is 7.3% amortized. The payment is $920. I were to recapture this 920 by making a chunk of 55 grand, which is within my what chunk range. It is no more than two thirds leveraged on my home equity line of credit. And it's no less than 12 months of future cash flow. It is above 12 months of future cash flow. What did I just do? $55,000 divided by what did I do? I just put 27 and a half months of cash flow at risk. <clears throat> now I'm going to show you how I reduce this risk tremendously. We're paying something off. We're getting this 920. We're removing the 7.3 and putting it into a 4.99 location. And technically speaking, I haven't lost the 27 and a half months of future cash flow because I used the bank's money first i used their 55k to pay this car off that car is now sitting in the heloc this is a revolving liquid line of credit any future dollars that goes into this heloc is immediately accessible so it's as if i did not put 27 and a half months of future capital at risk but I still like to illustrate that to the clients to show them what is happening. Show them what is occurring right now. So we now have 55 owed <clears throat> at 4.99%. 1,000, 4.99. <clears throat> In one year, if all I did was make interest only payments back to the HELOC, I will pay $2,744.50. But that's not accurate because it's only 4.99 for six months. What happens after six months? The rate will go 8.5%. So we can basically take that 2744 divided by two and say, okay, the first six months, the most amount of interest we'll pay is 
372. A guaranteed reduction in the amount of interest I was paying over here on the 920 because I no longer have that payment of 920 going to the car because it's been paid off. And because this HELOC in the second position is set up as a what, I'm only obligated to make interest only payments, which is really going to be like $228 a month is what that is looking like as of right now. In this example, we're not just making interest only payments. Velocity banking would come into play. I'm going to park my income into the line of credit. Expenses are now $920 less. So technically $10,000 $580 will now be coming out of the HELOC to pay bills. The same money that went in, same money's gonna be coming out. The only thing that stays in, which 100% of it will be registered as principal, and then interest gets minus. <clears throat> so now cash flow is 2,920 bucks, right? That's our new cash flow. So we can then, what I do, show the client what just occurred. 2,920 times 12 is now 35,000. If we were just applying the cash flow to the 55, it's gonna be a year and some months before this is gone rather than putting 27 and a half months of future cash flow at risk, no longer at risk, removed it completely. And if and when life happens, because it will, we remain liquid because instead of me sending this 2,000 a month, directly to the car payment on top of the 920 and then life happens where do i come up with money now i did mention this person has savings and money invested so they do have other locations that they can pull from but the risk of them doing that is they're now interrupting their compound interest they're interrupting compound interest on their investments if they were to pull borrow from their investments, handle a unexpected life expense. It might mean, it might be more costly from somewhere else than to pull from their HELOC to handle that unexpected expense. But now I'm not done here. There are three other tools that we've put in place to put parameters and protections on our strategy here of just simply eliminating this car and creating $920 in cash flow. In addition to our main debt tool being this HELOC at 4.99%, it's a simple debt consolidation move. Boom, boom. Income that we're sending to the HELOC is the payment each and every month, so no payment ever shows up. We never really have a payment because it always gets paid in advance. We're never really gonna pay whatever interest I just showed here. It's always gonna be less because of the velocity effect, right? And I can prove the math, I can show that. Then we have a credit card with a big bank, 0% for 21 months on purchases. With this, within this 11,500, we've identified $5,000 worth of expenses that we're paying on a monthly basis that we could, from paying monthly to annual, right? Five grand a month to kind of make things simple here and not itemize every single expense. What we discovered was that if we can, from paying all of these monthly expenses and pay them in full on an annual basis, right? We can, we can cherry pick certain expenses within the 5K, then we would save on average 10% or more. So I'm gonna round down and just say 10% on the bill itself going from monthly. So the question becomes, well, what? I don't have the money pay for the expense upfront annually. So therefore, instead of borrowing from a HELOC at 4.99%, we can borrow at 0%, which simply buys time. And once we've itemized those specific expenses that if we switch from monthly to annual, it's a savings on the expense itself. And then we park that in a card that has 0% on purchases of 300 bucks. That also reduces the total expenses that we're choosing to switch from monthly to annual. So this particular credit card, same rule, 20,000 times two thirds, 13,200. In this particular case, it's gonna be about $15,000 worth of expenses, totaling all totaled up for, you know, instead of, instead of spacing it out for the whole year, right? Paying it monthly, we're gonna bring it all together. In one year, the number was like 15 grand. So we're going slightly above 66%. And the reason why we're breaking our rule, violating our rule, 
is to achieve a particular result that would benefit us. So notice how these rules are our standards. What helps us justify go against the rule is dependent on what the gain is. If the gain would put us back under 66% leverage within that 12 month period, I'm okay with going a little bit higher and also the type of person that I'm dealing with. 15,000 bucks, when you break that down, it's technically from the 5,000, it was like $1,250, right? Of bills that get paid up for the whole year. And so it was 15K. Now the number was technically higher, but with the savings of roughly 10% or more, brings it down. All right, so I'm just gonna write 10% savings brings it down to 15 grand, then we're getting a $300 statement when we spend $3,000 or more within the first 90 days. And we've identified bills that are part of this person's lifestyle. We are not buying Prada shoes. We are not buying Mac and Mac. We are not buying Birkin bags. We are not buying Hugo Boss, Calvin Klein. We are not shopping randomly to get to the 3K. We're literally running life expenses that we know are going to occur in our life. That's a parameter. So if we rely on that and not just figure out how we can spend three grand, no, no, no. We're not trying to add expenses into the life. We're trying to remove expenses and increase cash flow temporarily. 15 grand and then minus 300, technically that cost of living got reduced to 14.7, right? But in all actuality, like the, the cash flow is gonna be around $1,200 or more in, in net savings. So technically, you know, I should use the 15K number. I really should have used a higher number, but I'm gonna keep underestimating here. And let's just say we've got 1250 in temporary cash flow. So 1250, which would mean moving forward for the time being 10580 minus 1250. So technically 9,000 expenses coming out of the HELOC because I just removed 12 months worth of bills. That is part of my lifestyle. This doesn't mean I go and add 12 new types of bills to my lifestyle. That's not what this means. Again, discipline, order, very, very important. I hope you're with me so far. We gained 1250. We saved 10% plus 300 back. And if you want to sweeten the pie even more, 2% cash back rewards on the 15,000 spent. So you get another 450, right? 15,000 times 2%, 300, sorry, get another $300. And the savings just keeps racking in. So I won't even account for that, right? Let's say the balance is now 14,700 on this second. And they're gonna charge us 1% of the balance for 21 months. So our expenses, 147 bucks. So 9,930 plus 147. We're just gonna set automatic payments for 21 months on that card. We sit and forget, that's it. That card is done. We need to have the discipline to not touch that. We already did the move. We got the win. Let's secure the win. This is now our new expense number. What's our cash flow now? 13.5 minus 9477. Seven. Now I'm at 4,023 times 12, 48. Getting close to that 55, aren't I? I'm real close now. Watch this. <clears throat> From the 5,000, we identified a 1250 boom, bomb, right? That's done. We're going to take. 3750 from the five, and we're just gonna consistently run it on this card, on this big bank credit card. We have an option here. <clears throat> we simply use the same method, like let's say um, we use the same credit limit, 66%. So this credit card has a credit limit of 15 grand times two thirds is 9,900. So let's just say, right, this credit card, 15K, 66%, 9,900 divided by 3750 for literally only two and a half months, right? For just two and a half months, you run 3750 on that card. And let's say that's our food, gas, miscellaneous, house products, bathroom products, consistent stuff. Stuff that's already in our lives, not new stuff. Consistent stuff that's already in our lives to cover our lifestyle. Let's say we just did two and a half months and stopped, right? This Again, these are parameters. You could break these and this is where risk would, would occur. Now, if you did that, you temporarily increase cash flow by $3,750, right? For just those two and a half months. Gives you a nice boost in the line of credit itself. And then again, once you hit 99, then you have a monthly payment of 99, 100 bucks, let's say, and you just stop and you just pay that for 21 months. Done. That's one way of using it. The second way is every single month you run as many bills as you can on that card and then you pay it back 
in full. But because there's a 0% offer on there for 21 months, you could leverage that. So some people get two and three and four and five cards. This is where leverage capacity must come into play. This is why when I'm working with a rookie, brand new, just getting in the mix of it, Usually it's one HELOC, one credit card is how I start them off. And once we build some discipline and I see that they have the, the diligence, the, the steward to keep these things at play and not abuse them, the moment you abuse these tools, it abuses you back in the form of interest and it's going to hurt, right? Because you're gonna plan for something and I'm telling you life will happen and then it messes you up. When we when we account for life happening, the the 66% that we leverage in here, the 66 we leverage in here, the 66 we leverage in there, right? What's left? 33%, 33%, 33%. All that gap is accounting for life. On top of the person having savings and investments, before even having to dip into those things, we have small cushions here that we've built in, right? And finally, we have this last card at a small bank a credit card at a small bank with a 0% on balance transfers, purchases for just 12 months and a zero balance transfer fee. So literally costs you nothing to move the money. Again, this is the picture perfect scenario. This is what I always look for. This is what I'm always trying to build with clients that we can get optimal success, plan for risk, get the results that we need. Way that we can use this last card is if there's another debt that they also wanted to get rid of that you can get a head start on and that's called double chunking. So you can kind of double dip. You can chunk out of the HELOC. We chunked at expenses, although I didn't really count it as a chunk. And then you would chunk from a credit card at a small bank credit union on 0%, 12 months, zero balance transfer fee. So it doesn't cost you anything to turn credit into cash and you pay something else off. Or we can simply sit on it. You don't have to use it right away. This could also be, we can declare this a buffer tool for when life happens. I can pull from this card and cover that li unexpected life expense and it doesn't interrupt my velocity strategy. So. Let's do velocity banking now on this. This HELOC at 4.99%, we wanna pay off this car as quickly as humanly, as, as quickly as possible. Now, in the first six months, we wanna really utilize that 4.99, which is why we moved the whole 7.3 in the 4.99. But what's gonna happen is it's gonna jump up to eight and a half. Eight and a half is more than 7.3. So if we are strategic, use our heads, where this tool could come into place is six months from now. Whatever's left owed on here, you move it into the credit union, credit card, didn't cost us a dime, and you are truly at 7.3, you move to 4.9, 4.9, you move to zero. Cost you nothing. So let's see what this would look like. Let's say we did the move with the card, so cash flow went up and for just two months, we're gonna run 3750 on that card, and that's gonna be 3750 more in cash flow for just two months. So we got minus 37, so 9477 minus 3750. 5,727. Look how much cash flow I just created in this example here. It went from two, now we're in the multiple thousands of dollars. Again, disclosure, full transparency, temporary cash flow gain because we're temporarily trying to speed up this particular debt removal, we're trying to make a play here, right? In order for the play to be successful, everyone needs to know their positions and not get out of hand and not go out of bounds. It's important. See where the balance goes down to. On this small credit union credit card, we have a 12K, right? 12K. Cost you nothing to move. 37.50, I'm going to just overestimate here and I'm gonna just declare a $100 payment. So I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it 50. So at 5827 accounts for the monthly payment on this card, the monthly minimum payment on that card, and removal of the car, right? All that good stuff. Let's say that all occurred in the first month. Let's say all that occurred in the first month. Um <clears throat> I'll be even more conservative. I'll say in the second month it all got completed. So for the first month, say it was a slight little delay. 13.5 went in, so balance goes down, 10. Five, we're at 52. Daily interest costs, $7.11 there on 41.5, 4.9%, we're at 5.67. I never spend a day owing 55. I'll just run between these two, 5.67 plus 7.11, bam, five by two, bam. We're looking at 191.75 or less 
in the first month. 5208 plus 19175. For the next two months, right? We're gonna now account for that second car coming in. We're gonna account for that as well. So now we're gonna show minus 771, then expenses out 5,000, 827, 44,000, 598. Comment below that you're with me. Let me recap. I feel like I lost somebody. Our first move, we took 55K out, paid off the car. You move 7.3 to 4.99, but it's only for six months. It's gonna jump to eight and a half. We wanna secure the win. So we're gonna do velocity banking now. We're not just gonna make interest only payments or monthly payments of 2,000 bucks plus a 920. No, we're gonna do all our income. So income went in, 13.5, expenses out, 10.58. With interest, ended around 52, 271.75. I'm now incorporating spending $15,000 on this credit card, of which we got $300 back in credit, 10% in savings. There's now a cash flow gain and a monthly minimum payment of around 147 bucks, which we accounted for right there. In the second month, I'm also gonna run $3,750 worth of bills that can be paid on a car. And I'm gonna earn 2% on that 3750, and I'm gonna have a monthly payment somewhere around 100 bucks after two and a half months in. So we're gonna do 3,750 twice. Technically, we would have done it almost three times, but being conservative, when you factor all that in, 3,750, 1,250, all this cash flow gain, technically now what's coming out of the home equity line of credit is only 5,827. So expenses, uh, income went in the second month, it brought the balance down, not all at once. This is just illustrating what it should ideally look like. Expenses came out, we're at 44, 5, 9, 8, 7, 5, 1.99%, $6 a day, 38, 7, 7, 1, 5.3, 5.3, plus 6.09, divided by 2. So we'll pay about $170 an inch, right? I promise you it's going to be way less than that. <clears throat> but again, we're overestimating. Room for error. Let me just double check my math. It was 5,827. See that? Income went in, expenses out. This is the end of what? Well, 2 equals 44, 5, 9, 8, 7, 5 plus... 170, we're at 44,769.60. See how fast this is going? Minus income, we're at 37. We'll do 3,750 times three. That would have been 11,250. 3,750 times two, 7,500 bucks. So in month two, we did it once. We ran 3,750 on the car. Month three, we're gonna do it again. After month three, we'll stop. But I'm still gonna uh, say that we owe 99 on the car, right? but I'm not even gonna register it here on the HELOC. Again, making it look worse, making the numbers look worse than what they should end up looking like because life will happen. 44, there we go, yeah, 44, 769, 60 minus 13, five. Yep, that's how I got to my number. How did I get that number? 44, 769, 60 minus 13, five. So this should be 31. Why did I write the 37? We're gonna find out in a second. 269 plus? Expenses out. That's how I got the number. We went from 191 to 170, so I'll just take another 20 bucks off and say 150, 246. Boom. Okay, now we're gonna stop. Cap of cash flow is gonna in decrease by 37.50 now. First move on the card is done. We're leaving that alone. Paying monthly minimum. This card is now done. We're leaving that alone. I'm gonna go a little bit faster now because I want to just show roughly what it should look like by month six. So I'm gonna do 5827. I'm gonna add 3750 back into the equation because this is assuming now that I'm running bills on this card, but I'm paying 3750 each and every month out of the HELOC. So I'm not gonna keep increasing the balance on the card, even though I have a $15,000 credit limit on there and I could keep going for a couple more months until it maxes out. That would be over leveraging. We're not gonna abuse. Right, we're just gonna simply stop. And then when it when it's time to pay the card, we're just paying 37.50 each time plus the monthly payment. So now we're looking at 9,577 is our new expense. This was month three. Month four, our expense is now 9577 for four, five, and six. Two, four, six minus income plus expenses. End of month four, 33,000. Let's go to five. Income in, expenses out. This is where I'm going a little fast. I'm obviously skipping math. Oh shoot, did that wrong. This was four, right? End of month three. This is four. This is 
fifth month. Now we'll end off at month six, minus income plus expenses. Okay. Obviously, I am skipping math on purpose, just showing you roughly where we should be at. We should be somewhere around 25,477.60 owed in month six. Month six, what happens? My intro rate expires to go to eight and a half percent. To secure the win even further, since we didn't use this card, this credit union card, we didn't use it, and now we're gonna activate it, okay? Now, sometimes credit cards will say you need to use the offer within the first 90 days. Sometimes they do that. Sometimes they extend it if you ask, right? So in this example, let's say we got a proof of the card shortly somewhere in between this time frame, and the offer is still there. Everything's good. We have a $12,000 credit limit to secure the win, pay even less interest than if you were to keep it over here on the, on the car loan paying extra payments. What we could do, turn credit into cash, do a convenience check that will register as a balance transfer for 12 months. You could say 12,000. This could be a good example of abusing the rule of leverage. Cost you nothing, that's a win. We still have space in this card. We still have space in this card. We have plenty of space in the HELOC, so you can justify it. So if you wanted to do it safe, 12K, you'd make a chunk of 8K. In this example, it doesn't cost me any more to go the extra four. Let's say we stripped 12,000 out of 25. So 25, 477, 60 minus 12,000. So now we're gonna owe in month seven, 137760. Look how it lines up perfectly with their income. Every month moving forward, their interest cost is gonna be so nominal. We're talking pennies on the dollar in terms of what they'll pay in interest moving forward. And then the monthly payment on that credit card, 1% of the balance can be 120 bucks. So their cash flow decreases by another 120. So 9577 plus 120. So month seven and onward, expenses 9,697, 135 minus 9697. So we're rocking at 3803 cash flow. HELOC's gonna be to zero instead of they have a hundred fifty thousand dollar credit limit 66 percent of that is ninety nine thousand at 3803 temporary cash flow times 12 is 45 could we potentially knock off another debt do we have to wait to hit zero on the heloc before making our next chunk knowing what our chunk we would say yes if there's an opportunity and it makes sense in this particular case right another car at six percent with like 20 2000 owed on it and a payment of like 480. So you could totally make the argument. Okay, yeah, instead of 6% over here, 480, let me move that 22 right over here. Even though I'm at 8.5, 8.5 .5 is not gonna be 8.5 in net interest cost. It'll be way less than 6% with their cash flow, doing velocity banking. We have all this time frame before this 21 months expires. Here's what happens. After 21 months of doing all this, right before you know month 19, month 20, you know we can go get more credit cards, right? And just restart the process. But that involves discipline to really make this happen and keep it steady and, and keep discipline with it. So that's a whole case study, proper case study, proper usage of the HELOC in the second position, big bank credit cards, small bank credit union credit cards, leverage capacity, leverage rules, What's your leverage threshold? Let's get aware. What are we solving for? Let's account for life. Life's gonna happen. In this example, let's say life happened, a $10,000 expenditure occurred. Let's say the $10,000 unexpected life event occurs in month six, when we initially plan to move 25, move 12K into the credit card. Instead of doing that, we're just gonna do 2K to bring down the 25 to 23, and we're gonna handle that unexpected life expense of 10 grand, and we're just gonna have it sit on that credit union credit card. That would be the move I'd make, right? And just keep doing velocity banking. Now, if you're wondering, oh my goodness, but the rate then Zell goes to eight and a half. Remember, eight and a half is not really eight and a half on the HELOC in terms of what we pay in net interest, right? On 25K, which would be say 23K doing velocity banking at eight and a half percent is the new listed rate moving forward on that HELOC, we've already secured the win with the 7.3. Whatever interest I pay over here, this is not new interest. This interest that I'm paying is coming from the car. It was interest I was paying anyway. So you didn't increase your interest cost, you reduced it even though you're in a higher rate environment. That is where the sound of the, you know, the confusion occurs sometimes, okay?